Welcome back to the Canadian Concussion Center's webinar series, uh, which is sponsored by LIUNA, the Labour's International Union of North America. Uh, I'm Leslie Rattan, and I'm really pleased to be moderating our webinar, webinar series, which has been developed for people uh, that struggle with concussion, their families, friends, as well as healthcare providers. And if you've been here before, you know that this is uh, recurring every other Tuesday evening from 6 to 7 p.m. And the sessions are also recorded. So if you have any interest in looking at any previous sessions, you can actually go to uh, the Canadian Concussion Center website and we have those all uploaded. Uh, Christian is gonna be putting those into the chat. So uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see a, a chat function. So he's going to post that a couple times throughout the evening. Uh, and we'll also be posting uh, a PDF of tonight's presentation. Uh, so again, if you've been here before, you know that we're going to hear um, have an expert speaker for the first half, and then that's going to be followed by about a half an hour or so uh, of question and answers. And so if you have any questions, feel free to enter those into the Q&A function. If, again, if you look at the bottom of your screen to the right-hand side, uh, and you can enter those at any point uh, if you have any questions. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, please enter those into the chat section and Christian will get back to you. Uh, and just before we proceed, we're just gonna run a very quick poll. It's really helpful for us to know who we have in the audience. Uh, so that is going to pop up momentarily, and if we can just get you to uh, indicate which group uh, you fall within, um, that would be really helpful. Okay, so for this evening's session, I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. David Miklas, who's going to be talking to us about imaging and concussion. And Dr. Miklas is a full professor and director of the Functional Neuroimaging Research Lab in the Joint Department of Medical Imaging at the University Health Network and the University of Toronto. The primary emphasis of his work has been translational research, focusing on the application of novel imaging methods into the clinical environment. He established one of the first FMR I labs in Canada in 1993 and is currently involved in developing advanced neurovascular imaging methods for assessing the structural and functional health of the cerebrovascular system. And I can see Christian has just put the uh, PDF of the talk into the chat so you can find that there. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nicholas now. Well, thank you, Leslie, for that kind introduction. I'm going to begin by uh, providing a disclosure, and I uh, do research uh, using a uh, non-commercial investigational device uh, built by Thornhill Research for assessing brain blood flow abnormalities in uh, various disease states, including concussion. So the way I'm going to structure this presentation is um, I'll begin first by uh, describing some of the anatomy the structural issues and the functional issues related to concussion on the background of what we know about um, brain structure and <clears throat> uh, brain structure and function. And then I'd like to switch over to a um, discussion about what we can and what we can't see with normal brain imaging <clears throat> or clinical brain imaging. And then I'd like to discuss a little bit about how advanced imaging techniques can provide information about concussion, and then move on to a comparison between these advanced imaging techniques and what we're learning from blood-based analysis in patients with concussion. So the brain is composed mostly of neurons, but there are also other structural elements. But what you can see here is a single neuron and how complex it is. We see the dendrites that receive information and then we see the axon that send information to other neurons. And the structures are very delicate. In fact, here's a neuron that was grown on a computer chip by John Stevens at the Toronto Western Hospital. And you can see how tiny these fibers are both coming toward the neuron and leaving the neuron. This is the axon bundle or the axon of the neuron compared to these silicon channels in a computer chip. So the 
the neurons themselves are very delicate structures. And here we have an image of a neuron, as I've described, and then we have glial cells. And the glial cells are actually more numerous than the neurons in the human brain, up to 10 times more numerous than axons. And you can see how complex their structural connections are both to neurons and to blood vessels. Then we have another class of cells in the brain called oligodendrocytes. And these are important because they wrap themselves around the axons to um, aid conduction of um, electrical signals coming from the axons being sent to other axons. And what's really neglected, I think, in this whole field of research is that it's focused on these axons that are derived from the neurons, but there are a whole slew of other fine, delicate processes, including these, the arms of the oligodendrocyte and the branches of the glial cells that have not really been investigated. So this is kind of an, an area where additional research is, uh, is needed because I think that could provide additional information about how the concussive injury affects the human brain. And if we look at the complexity of just neurons alone, it's just staggering. There are 86 billion neurons in the brain, and on average, each one has about 7,000 connections. If we put it all together and look at all the cells in the brain, you can see a highly structured, complex organizational, organizational network. And what's even more surprising is, in spite of all of this dense, these dense cellular elements, somehow you have to fit blood vessels in. So if you look at a piece of cortex right here, you can see the complex vascular network that supplies the metabolic requirements, all of this complex tissue and the complex function the tissue carries out. And then neurons connect to neurons, we know that. And we know that blood vessels are connected to themselves, but what's neglected is this connection of the glial cells, both to the blood vessels as shown here and to the neurons themselves. And this was seen by the uh, Spanish anatomist and histologist Ramoni Cajal. And he won the Nobel Prize in the late, late 19th century for describing these relationships under the microscope. And what's important is that these glial cells are kind of housekeepers. So they, they keep the metabolic environment of the tissue under uh, certain constraints so that the tissue can function at its optimal. Um, capability, but it's important to see that these are connections coming, uh, the glial cells connect neurons with the blood vessels. And it's really important for the blood to be optimized, blood flow to be optimized to the tissue to support it um, in uh, the best way possible. And this becomes a theme later on in the presentation. So following brain trauma, what do we see? Well, there's alteration of tissue structure, there's alteration of tissue function. And when tissue structure is disrupted, we can see axonal injury. And then we see new tissue constituents that appear, including deposits of amyloid and tau proteins, which I, we know are related to ongoing neurodegeneration. There also is uh, hemorrhage from broken blood vessels that appears. And there's inflammation. And inflammation is the reaction of the brain to the injury. And so cellular elements come into the brain that normally wouldn't be there. And as a result of all of that structural injury, we see changes in neural network function. <clears throat> there's alterations in the organization and efficiency of that function. And there's disruption of neurovascular coupling, that crucial element that links blood flow to brain metabolism. And what we see in acute and chronic concussion is that there is evidence of blood flow dysregulation, which can then lead to further secondary injury and more neuroinflammation. So see, these are some of the issues that need to be kept in mind and they turn out to be imaging targets for us to try to better understand the extent and uh, nature of the injury. So from a clinical imaging perspective, what do we see? Well, if we look at an MRI in someone who's had traumatic brain injury, the three basic abnormalities we see in the brain are uh, diffuse axonal injury. So the axons themselves get disrupted directly by the traumatic event. When the blood vessels 
are injured, they can leave uh, iron deposits from having uh, bled in the brain tissue. And then we can see scars in the brain, which are caused by direct injury and contusion of the brain, usually bumping up against the skull surface. So the axonal injury is typically seen on an MRI as these little white spots here that the arrow is pointing to. And then following hemorrhage, we see iron deposition in the brain in these black areas. And that's where the MRI signal is lost because of the effect of the iron, uh, magnetic field of the iron on the homogeneity of the magnetic field generated by the MRI system. And then we see these areas where you have a black area that's similar to cerebral spinal fluid. And in fact, that's what this turns out to be because the brain is no longer present. It basically melted. It was injured so badly that the tissue disintegrated over time. And in reaction to that tissue disintegration, an inflammatory response resulted in the white areas around the cavity are the reaction of the glial cells to clean up the uh, damaged tissue. So this is this would be called a, uh, evidence of an old brain contusion where there's tissue loss and evidence of scar formation in the brain. So we can see that with brain MR imaging, but do we see that in concussion? That's the question. And what's been determined is that most people who have a concussion don't go on to additional imaging. Although the ones that are referred for CT scanning, most of the CT scans are normal. In fact, they generally are normal, but 30% of the normal CT scans found in this study were found to have abnormalities on MRI. Now, part of the problem with this statement is that there's a, there's a debate about whether or not a concussion falls into the category of neurological conditions in which the MRI is normal. So in this study, they actually looked at mild traumatic brain injury. And in those patients, it's not uncommon to find abnormalities in MRI. So we, we looked at this issue ourselves. And what we did was we decided to examine 127 patients who had post-concussion syndrome. And we compared their MRIs to 29 healthy controls. And we found that 97% of these patients who are diagnosed with concussion clinically diagnosed with concussion, had normal MRI scans, except for these white matter hyperintensities. These white matter hyperintensities are seen in a normal population and are a function of aging. And so therefore we don't, although, that, although these can be caused by axonal injury, they can also be caused by other mechanisms such as chronic migraine, or patients who are exposed to vascular risk factors like high blood pressure or diabetes. So these white matter hyperintensities in and of themselves are not specific for brain injury caused by head trauma. They can be seen in the healthy aging population as well as in patients with vascular risk factors. So that's where we draw the line. We believe that any patient who has an abnormal MRI that shows evidence of iron deposition or, or scarring from contusions is that uh, uh, has sustained a much stronger brain injury than that which would have caused a standard concussion. Okay, so what's the nature of this injury and why is it so challenging to see it? Why is MRI normal in patients who have concussion? Well, we have to examine the tissue structure a little bit. And the most important structure that research has shown is the, the uh, microtubule. And so what are these microtubules? Well, they're depicted in this picture here. And the microtubules are literally structures that pass from the body of the, the cell body of the neuron out to the synapse, and they run along the axon. And they, they, they have two functions. One is they act as a structural support so that these very delicate fibers are basically reinforced by these structural, uh, the so-called so skeleton of the axon. But they just don't, these microtubules aren't just structural uh, uh, support um, uh, 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 entities in the, brain, in, the, in the axon, but they also function to transport material. And what happens is that um, there are constituents in the cell that need to go to the synapse to make the synapse function. So they're transported from the cell body and used by this uh, synapse to transfer electrical information, but they wear out over time and they have to get sent back to the body for re recycling, so to speak. 
And some of these elements are lipids, proteins, mitochondria, the energy batteries of the cell, synaptic vesicles, which are important for transmission of the signal, and, and lysosomes. So this is a very important structural and functional element, but it is prone to injury. And we know that from research. We know that if you bend this, it can injure the microtubule. So we, if we look at this, this diagram, we have a cell. This is the neuron. We see the body and we see the axon coming from it. And within it, we see in cross-section these microtubules. And the microtubules, interestingly enough, are stabilized by tau molecules, these blackish, curly-looking molecules that keep this structure together. And what's important is that in patients with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, guess what? It's this tau protein that gets deposited and tau is neurotoxic. So when you injure the microtubule, it's clearly um, a, a, me a mechanism for release of these tau molecules that then assemble uh, and cluster and form neurotoxic deposits in the brain. So it all begins to make sense as to how neuronal injury, axonal injury can lead to this chronic traumatic encephalopathy condition. And we see that in sports concussion. Multiple con concussions typically are required before subjects uh, get this type of encephalopathy. So microtubules bend and can break at the moment of injury, axoplasmic transport is interrupted. And because of that, proteins, these, these things that are being transported build up and they form what are called varicosities and bulbs. So here we bend the axon, and this is what it looks like under the microscope. This is a background of normal axons, and there's one axon here that has accumulated, has suffered injury, and is accumulating these, uh, these elements and become, it's becoming enlarged and structurally not functioning properly. And then if the neuron is broken at the time of injury, then you get what is called a retraction bulb. And if you look in the human brain, uh, a uh, comparison of male and female axons and the microtubules within them, you can see that there's an increased vulnerability of the female brain compared to the male brain. And it's based on the fact that uh, female axons have a smaller diameter, so they're smaller compared to the male axon. They contain fewer numbers of the microtubules. And it's not just few, not fewer numbers in the female axon, the concentration of the microtubules is smaller than it is in the male axon. You can see that in terms of these statistically significant differences in the graphs of axon cross-sectional area, number of microtubules per axon, and then more importantly, and most importantly, the microtubule density. And they did structural analysis and determined that the smaller neuron with the fewer microtubules is much more sensitive to the same degree of um, force exerted on the axon by an injury event, um, uh, lender, uh, rendering the female axon more vulnerable to this type of uh, uh, disruption with the varicosities and the retraction bulbs I've shown previously. So why is it so difficult to see this injury on conventional imaging? Well, it's a microscopic injury and it's sparse. So if we look at a histology slide, we see maybe 10 of these abnormal neurons on our background, thousands of healthy appearing neurons. And when we put someone's head into an MRI scanner, we break up the space inside the MRI scanner into these little volume elements. And whatever is in the volume element shows up on the image. And if the volume element is in air, it'll be black. If the volume element is in brain tissue, for example, gray matter versus white matter, those two tissues will have a slightly different signal intensity. But to pick up these tiny little um, injured axons is probably not what we're seeing on MRI. We're probably seeing some more diffuse injury that may affect far more axons, but we still don't know what the nature of that injury is. Nevertheless, being able to see that injury in an individual subject is a problem and we just can't see it. We know it's there and we can't see it and advanced imaging tells us it's there and we'll get into that. So I'm going to talk about imaging and then talk a little bit about using uh, sampling blood to detect the presence of a concussion. <clears throat> so we have um, quantitative tools available to us for measuring 
uh, structural and functional uh, brain injury. But I want to mention uh, before we get into, into uh, a more advanced description of this um, and to answer the important question, how good are these tools uh, to go to one of the functional tools, which is commonly used for this purpose, which is uh, SPECT. So we have advanced imaging using injected radioactive tracers. That's what SPECT imaging is. It stands for single proton emission computed tomography. Then we have the advanced MRI methods, and then we have magneto and electroencephalography. And that's not my area of expertise, but I can also say that it's not used that frequently and there's not a lot of literature on the effectiveness of this, although this is a promising field as well and may contribute in the future. So this is a SPECT um, device. And you can see it looks a lot like an MRI with a tunnel and a table. And a radioactive traces, tracer is injected to measure uh, blood flow. And this is what SPECT imaging looks like in different uh, individuals. And what is found in healthy adults in this publication was that there's a significant regional variation in the signal uptake from person to person. So this creates a problem because what we're looking for is we're looking for these areas, hot spots and cold spots. But you can see in a healthy individual, we see both. Here's another healthy individual where we see a couple of hot spots. So how do we know that those are uh, normal versus being abnormal? Uh, so a literature review was done to look at the effectiveness of making a diagnosis of traumatic brain injury. This is not just concussion. This is a little bit more severe brain injury. And it only had a positive predictive value of 59%. It was almost like flipping a coin as to whether you could determine a patient was normal or abnormal on a SPECT scan. So the problem is that the interpretation of the images is very subjective based on the individual's experience and uh, perception of the degree of injury. And what's needed is a more objective assessment for this, which would require uh, a standardized data acquisition method and a quantitative analysis of the data. And because we haven't had that, uh, the Ontario Supreme uh, Superior Court ruled in just recently, 2021, that SPECT scans failed to meet the reliability foundation tests for novel scientific evidence. So how do we make it better? Well, there is a methodology to do that. And what we need to do is build a healthy brain atlas. We need to sample the healthy population, and then we need to merge that data. So take each individual patient, and they, we warp the brain into a common space. And then in each area, a little tiny element in the brain, we can determine what the mean uh, blood flow is and what the standard deviation within that region is. So basically it's creating a Z-scoring comparison. And the way the Z-scoring works is um, uh, looking at just a, a standard um, distribution, a Gaussian distribution uh, in any measurement, in any biological system. So you, you'll find that there'll be a mean value and then there'll be a value of one standard deviation and two standard deviations and more in the general population. And in medicine, we typically believe that anyone who's more than two standard deviations away from this mean, so that would be out here or out here, would be considered to be abnormal. So this is the standard bell curve for doing that. And if you do do that, you get interesting results. So for example, here's a spec scan in someone who had head trauma. And one of the things you see, yellows and oranges, and you immediately worry that this is going to be abnormal. But how abnormal is it? Is it enough to say that the patient has evidence of brain injury? So what's done is they've created, one of the vendors uh, for these spec machines has created software, and they've collected healthy control data. And they looked at a whole number of different regions, and they began to plot how many standard deviations the blood flow was away from this zero level. And zero is the normal. So this would be the absolute mean of the population. And minus two would be two standard deviations. Minus four would be four standard deviations plus and minus four, et cetera, as you go out. So you can already see that this person has abnormalities more than two standard deviations outside the normal range. But if you look at the 46 areas of the brain, all of them almost have a uh, more than more than one, more than two standard deviation, um, lower than normal value for blood flow. So based on this, 
you would say that this patient absolutely has evidence of abnormal blood flow in the brain following uh, the head injury. So that's a solution. Not every SPECT site has this capability. And I'm not sure that um, there are many that are currently accepting patients with that capability to be able to run that test. Okay, so I'm gonna to switch to advanced MRI methods. Uh, these methods use imaging to measure the thickness of the brain cortex, which decreases over time as a function of brain injury because of direct injury to the axons and other constituents. MRI diffusion tensor imaging looks at how well the axons are um, uh, preserved or injured. You can see disruption here on the diffusion tensor imaging. And then resting state connectivity looks at how blood flow fluctuates in the brain within networks. So within a network, say this blue network compared to the red network, the blood flow fluctuations will be the same in these disparate areas because they all belong to the same network but they'll all move up and down as the network activity increases and decreases. So we can measure those changes in blood flow with MRI in those networks. And then we can look at how well the blood vessels respond to stimuli, stimuli from uh, neurons to increase or decrease blood flow based on their metabolic activity. So we, look at, we can look to see how much the blood vessels open in the brain su substance itself and how quickly they open. And that's the subject of some of the research my lab has been carrying out. So we have volumetric imaging and much the same as you saw in the SPECT scan, we divide the brain up into multiple different regions and we look to see what the volume of the cortex is. Is it getting thinner or not? And we did a study uh, looking at this um, at the concussion center and we looked at the whole brain and all we found was maybe there was a subtle change in this structure right here, which is in the hippocampus of the brain, which had a trend toward losing volume, but was not statistically significant, even in a group of individuals. And then another study was carried out show, showing the same issue where they found changes in brain volume, but only in a large group of subjects and not individuals. And if you look at the scatter of this graph, what we're measuring is the thickness of the parietal cortex here, at, and the age of the subject. And the yellow green line shows that in a healthy aging population, there's a downward slope, meaning the cortex gets thinner as you get older at a rate of 0 .2, 0 0.02 millimeters per year. But if you looked at the subjects that were concussed, these are, these are um, uh, US service veterans who experienced blast injury. And you can see in this, um, blue green line that the slope is steeper, that they were actually losing not 0 0.02 millimeters per year, but 0 0.08 millimeters per year, four times faster loss of cortical thickness than the healthy population. But there's so much scatter in the data, you can't tell the difference between the, a healthy individual versus a concussed individual. This is becoming a recurrent theme. What about diffusion tensor imaging? Well, we can measure the structural changes in the tissue um, based on how water is detecting, how, how the MRI is detecting differences in water movement based on how a disease disrupts normal biological barriers. And here's a tissue with a normal biological barrier, celery. So we can see these fibers in the celery and how they would structure water differently than the rest of the uh, stalk of the celery. And if you do regular old conventional MRI imaging, this is what you see, not much of a difference between those those fibers and the rest of the celery stalk. But if you add a diffusion gradient to the MRI pulse sequence, these areas light up because they're restricting the movement of water. And we can do that with MRI. We can create these beautiful fiber bundles, tracking how neuron bundles and networks are connected to each other in the brain and brainstem. And an interesting study was done examining this. They looked at the fiber bundles in a patient, in patients who had subconcussive injury. And what they found is where the arrows are pointing, there was injury right at the junction between the brain and the brainstem. So the brain would twist on the axis of the brainstem, and this is where the injury was occurring in these subconcussed individuals. So we believe we would find the same findings in concussion. And this turns out to be the most vulnerable fiber tract in the brain to the rotational forces caused by head injury. And we can detect that, but the problem was 
that this required a group of individuals to be able to see these differences, healthy individuals compared to a group of subconcussed individuals. And you can see why we got the same scatter problem. There is a difference. This mean here against this mean control versus the traumatic range, where we see a, a decrease in the fractional anisotropy that's statistically significant, but there's a huge overlap between the two populations. What about resting state fMRI? Now we're looking at the blood flow changes induced by networks becoming turning on and turning off. And the blood flow changes, we're sampling every two seconds or so to see how the, the blood flow is changing in the brain. And if you look at these three areas of the brain and we look at the changes of blood flow over time, we can see that this waveform and this waveform are probably more similar to each other than this waveform would be. And so you say, well, maybe these two areas of the brain are connected. And so we expect this area to be more connected to this area forming part of a network. Well, if we do that, and someone who's put into the MRI scanner and told to do nothing at all, this is what we see. We see what's called a default mode network, and this is the vigilance network. So you're in the scanner, you're not doing anything, you're just kind of either thinking about something or maybe you're paying attention to a noise or, or looking out the scanner through a mirror in the tunnel, and this is the network that gets activated. This is, this is a very important network. It's the most robust network in the brain at rest. If you are active, you can see the motor network. And even if you're not active, this will, can be teased out of the same signal intensity. So this would be controlling your arms and legs and head motion. And that's another network that can be detected. But this one is the most robust one. So we take the most robust one and we looked at individuals with, with mild, whoops, mild traumatic brain injury. And what we see is that this default mode network is nowhere near as robust as we had expected to be. So compare this image with this one. And there were definite group level differences showing reduced connectivity. That makes sense. As axons are being sent from one area to another area, they are being injured and not functioning properly. So then we can go to a more advanced type of analysis, which is this graph theory. And what it does is it looks at how well a network is connected locally and then how well it connects to another hub of the same network. And what they found was that the brain is more connected to itself locally, but that the pathway between connections is more convoluted. So the brain is trying to get signals from one area to another but it's, more, uh, it's taking a more uh, circuitous pathway to find its destination. That's how this data was interpreted. And, but again, this was a group difference that was seen against a group of healthy controls, not able to be used in an individual. Um, so what if we combine this functional information with the structural information? Can that give us a more powerful way to do this? And I think the answer is going to be yes, but not without some help. And why is it, why can it be done? Well, it can be done in less complex brains than human brains. It can only be done in a small nematode brain. And they only have 300 neurons compared to the human brain, which has 86 billion, uh, 86 billion neurons. So we're a long way from doing that, but there's still another approach to this technique that I'll describe. Before I get there, I'll just mention one last thing um, about uh, this connection between brain blood flow and, and the neurons. And what we do is we measure this. We measure how well the blood flow increases or decreases. And what we do is we can give a stimulus, carbon dioxide, which measures, which allows us to measure how quickly the blood flow changes in the brain and how much it changes in the brain. So we measure that with a blood flow method and we give a quantitative carbon dioxide stimulus. When we do that in a patient with anemia and compare it to our healthy control database again, we find that we get a lot of blue and this patient with anemia is actually behaving between one and two standard deviations below normal. And when you're anemic, you're not delivering, uh, you're not able to, you have to increase the amount of blood flow to your brain just to deliver enough uh, oxygen and nutrients to, to keep the tissue going. But when you open up the blood vessels at rest, when you stimulate it further, it doesn't increase as fast or doesn't increase as, uh, as much. So you use up some of your, what we call vascular reserve to do that. And if you look at concussion, we have a very striking finding. This is within one week of concussion, 
And if we put a healthy control in, you see some yellow and you see some blue. So you say, well, maybe this is abnormal in a healthy control, but in a concussed patient, the response was unbelievably strong and robust and, and, and not seen in any other disease we've studied. And that includes patients with hardening of the arteries and patients who um, have had uh, other forms of diseases affecting the brain like Alzheimer's disease. And what we found is that there's a much stronger response and a much faster response, both in the gray matter and the white matter. And our AUC curves are 0.9 and 0.93. So what does AUC mean? A perfect test, you would get an AUC curve that would go like this and would be one. A perfect test is one. A totally unuseful test would follow this green line because this would be a 50-50 chance that the test was correct. So the higher the AUC value toward one, the better the test. And as far as we know, from a, from a neuroimaging perspective, this one test has the highest AUC of any other imaging test we have found close to being diagnostic in the 0.9 range. If you test for a blood glucose, um, the AUC value for that is 99.8. So it as good, is as good a test as there can be. And this is in the 0.9 to 0.93 range, which is excellent. Um, we think it's probably um, a disruption maybe in this autonomic innervation of nerves uh, by nerves in the brainstem that go to the blood vessels and to neurons and they help to control brain blood flow. And since they start in the, uh, in the brainstem, these neurons are very long and they go right through that vulnerable area at the junction between the brain and the, and the brainstem itself. That's probably where the injury to this control system is disrupted. So the, the status of advanced neuroimaging, we have applied highly advanced imaging, but we are only able to make group level diagnoses. We cannot at this point make a diagnosis in a single subject with high certainty. That's where we are. That's the state of the art today. So what is our solution? And I think our solution is unification of structural and functional imaging metrics, and then assessed with artificial intelligence methodology. And that has been done in schizophrenia. So a group in the um, Mayo Clinic, uh, working with uh, South Korean colleagues in the Gwangju Institute of Science and Technology did this. And they looked at several structural metrics of MRI and said several functional metrics, just like I've shown you. Then they applied an advanced AI engine. And what were the results? In a patient with schizophrenia, which is another condition in which the MRI is normal, they, were, they achieved an accuracy of 99.3%. So that AUC value is 99.3%. This is diagnostic. It's absolutely diagnostic. We can make the diagnosis of schizophrenia just by putting someone in an MRI system and doing this advanced imaging and data analysis. What about imaging blood? Or not imaging blood, but sampling blood. This has been attempted and hasn't yet succeeded. So lots of things are released into the blood after brain injury. They can make group level successful comparisons, but not yet ready for a single subject diagnosis. But there is still hope in this area. And colleagues at the University of Western Ontario have looked at proteomics and they sampled over 1400 plasma proteins in the brain. And they found that three of them, these three here, ATOX, SPARC, and NT5, these only three of these were required to get the AUC curve for 0.98 for making a diagnosis of concussion. What's really interesting was the breast performer was SPARC. And this has to do with the uh, generation of new blood vessels. So it kind of correlates with our idea that blood vessels are really important in this regard. So imaging and concussion summary, I think AI will have a major impact on uh, imaging and on proteomics. I think together we might be able to use a simpler analysis of what's released in the blood to determine whether or not someone has had traumatic brain injury or concussion. Uh, but the challenge then is going to become at the next level. What about com comorbidity? Say that you're healthy and you have a concussion, that's fine. But what happens if you have concussion and depression? How do we know that these tools aren't gonna be confounded by the presence of depression and give us an erroneous diagnosis of concussion? So that's where the next challenge will uh, become. So just wanna wish everyone a happy Halloween. And uh, I think routine cl clinical imaging diagnosis of concussion it's not there yet, but the future is bright. And uh, thank you for your attention.
Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Miklas, uh, for that really, uh, really uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. We have a few questions. Uh, Heather asked, what's the difference between white spots caused from a concussion or brain damage and one caused from a stroke? I think that's a really great, <laughs> it's a great question. And we'd all like to know the answer to that. And there's a reason why we don't know the answer to this. Uh, these white spots are small. They're on the order of a millimeter or so. So if someone were to submit a brain like this, first of all, to get a postmortem of the brain like this would be difficult. And then to ask the pathologist to find one of these things, because they're not visible when you examine the brain. So they would literally have to have something that we would, uh, is currently being developed, which is to do a postmortem MRI and then to use that to guide a biopsy of the exact tissue to see what's in it. And to date, there haven't been a lot of, I haven't yet seen a study in concussion that's done that. We kind of know that these white spots caused by the stroke that um, the uh, audience member was asking about uh, has evidence of demyelination. So the myelin fibers are not healthy and evidence of gliosis, so a, a reaction of the glial cells around it. We think we would see the same thing with concussion. And I mentioned before those oligodendrocytes have these arms that connect to the axons. I wouldn't be surprised if those <clears throat> are also getting disrupted in addition to the axons. So the axons literally would demyelinate and potentially cause inflammation that would cause a glial reaction. So they may actually be very similar histologically. Great, thank you. I hope you. that answers the question. Thanks, we have a question from John. Uh, he wants to know, can white matter hyperintensities be seen in the young? So for example, under 40 years, without any sinister concerns in those who have MRI for non-trauma? So for example, investigating new onset of clinically benign headache. And then he asks, is there any follow-up, um, if any, that you would recommend in such a case? Yes, so it's a really great question. Uh, we typically don't see them. We don't see white matter hyperintensities in the younger age group, except for the one condition uh, that was uh, questioned, which is headache. In those patients who have chronic headache syndromes like migraine headache that are very difficult to treat, they have, they, we have noticed that they start to develop in younger patients. So when I see a young patient with them, that's the first question I ask is this, does the patient have chronic headaches? Then the next question is, do they have vascular risk factors? So one thing that we're finding is that, um, what are vascular risk factors? They are diabetes, hypertension, high blood lipids, sedentary lifestyle. We know that those things can affect the health of brain blood vessels. And when the brain blood vessels aren't healthy, you get neurovascular uncoupling. So there's a lot of metabolic energy uh, requirements to keep a healthy brain going. And if there's any deficit over time, chronic exposure to a lack of proper blood flow increases when the circuits become active, that can starve those cells that keep the brain healthy, including the glial cells, the, neur the neurons themselves, and the oligodendrocytes that keep the myelin healthy. So that, that would be the next question. If the child uh, or uh, young adult uh, had no evidence of headache, we'd then want, we'd begin to ask, do they have vascular risk factors? And have they been investigated, been investigated for those? Great, thank you. Um, and just a reminder to everyone out there, if you have questions, if you can just enter those into the Q&A uh, as opposed to the chat. Um, is there a typical natural history of spec changes following an MTBI? Does blood flow return to normal? Has there been clinical correlation with spec changes? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think we have found that uh, they're not a lot, not enough longitudinal studies to make statements, uh, accurate statements about that. We know from cross-sectional studies that uh, people who have had brain injury can normalize blood flow and that there are people who have chronic uh, uh, areas where the blood flow is diminished. 
But the question is, if you, if you have an injury, do we know that the blood flow is abnormal? And did it stay abnormal? And did some people actually recover completely or not? And those longitudinal studies haven't been haven't really been done to know whether or not uh, the ability to heal is effective and how effective it is. So is it that 90% of people restore blood flow, 99% people restore blood flow, or the ones that don't restore blood flow, do they have uh, a persistence and even worsening of blood flow changes over time? Uh, the SPECT studies are not sensitive enough to detect that, and we haven't, don't have enough longitudinal studies in MRI to really know the answer to that question. It's a, it's a really important one, and I'm glad you asked because we're just putting in a, a grant proposal to work with the Hallelis Clinic, and we're going to examine these patients at one week, four weeks, and eight weeks after concussion. We're going to do these structural and functional MRI assessments, and on top of that, we're going to exercise these people because we think that graded exercise could actually help to improve recovery from concussion and maybe prevent the post-concussion syndrome. In fact, we may get insights into it. We think that post-concussion syndrome may have some um, similarities to migraine because in those patients, they, have, they may have persistence of dysregulated blood flow, which would be bad for the brain. Great, thank you. Uh, back to the white matter lesions, Stacy's asking, so uh, you've got white matter lesions in a 51 year old female who's had many concussions. Can something be done to fix these lesions? That's a great question. These are all great questions. <laughs> they're all, they're all questions that form, you know, research topics that are currently being investigated. So we have looked at this and I have a graduate student looking at this right now, but not in concussions. It's in patients who have hardening of the arteries and who have treatment for that. And we have seen in some instances that the white matter hyperintensity is improved, that if you restore the blood flow, then the tissue can heal. But if the blood flow stays um, diminished, there's just not a, a, the ability to heal isn't there because the blood flow deficit causes the problem. How can it heal if it still doesn't have the blood flow it needs to restore itself? So we think that's gonna be a critical element. And one study that needs to be done, and actually I started a study with the family uh, health team at the Toronto Western, but then COVID hit just when we started recruiting patients and it killed the study, but it was to examine patients who had vascular risk factors, just like this, <clears throat> to see what would happen over time. Would their white matter hyperintensities <clears throat> get worse over time? And we, we want to get that study back going again. And that's going to be the next target of our, uh, our research is to reestablish that work we're going to do with the health team. Great. Thank you. Uh, and further on uh, blood vessels, Nadine is asking, do damaged blood vessels in the body impact blood flow in the brain? Not that I know of, um, unless they, uh, unless something gets released. So there's a lot of talk about RNA being released in damaged tissue and how that might circulate through the body and either have positive or negative effect, effects on other tissues. So theoretically it's possible, but I have no, I know of no known studies that have shown evidence that that happens. Uh, Karen asks, is there evidence that neurofeedback can detect or improve concussion symptoms? Yeah, that's an area that I'm not as familiar with. And um, I think that uh, it's kind of similar to um, what has been seen with patients with stroke. So to get, to get function to return, you might want to try, try to enable um, healthy networks to try to take over some of the work that the unhealthy network was um, uh, in control of before the injury. And so there are methods to try to induce what we call brain plasticity. So the brain can heal itself by invoking um, in some cases, some neurogenesis, although that doesn't happen that extensively, but some new neurons can form, but some existing neurons can take over the work 
of the injured neurons. So if you can think of a task that's timed just right so that not too early during the injury and not too late after the injury, it may be possible to influence the, the recovery under those circumstances. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question. Why do concussion sufferers wear sunglasses and noise reducing headphones? Are the pathways for eyes and ears the longest in the brain? Um, no, they're not necessarily the longest pathways, um, but there is uh, the idea that you have to have a healthy brain to suppress um, the volume of information being thrown at it. So whenever you're looking at something or listening to something, there is there are things coming into the central nervous system that are not what you're interested in looking at or hearing. So you can imagine being in a crowded crowded room with everyone speaking. You need to have the ability to suppress sound that you don't want to hear and enhance the sound that you do want to hear. But if you, and there, I think there are certain feedback loops in the auditory circuit and the visual circuit that help focus concentration to be able to do those things. So uh, an example, I guess, in the visual circuit would be, you know, lighting in a room that is changing, fluctuating a lot, and you're trying to focus on one object in the room, how can you best do that and eliminate a lot of the noise in the system? And it takes healthy neurons to do that. You need, and if some of those have been injured cause, due to concussion, it's problematic. And some people feel that that's one of the reasons people are autistic is that they cannot deal with the noise that enters into the system. They don't have the neuronal capability to filter the signal that they want to be interested in from the noise and it's just too much. So after you've been concussed, you, you just want to limit the input. So you put sunglasses on or you put you know something over your ears because it's just too much of an input that you have, are not used to being able to handle in the absence of these, you know, the healthy neurons that you may have lost that were, that were functioning to suppress that noise. Great, thank you. Uh, John is asking, so regarding schizophrenia, when you were speaking about that, what was the gold standard? And then he's commented 99.3% accuracy for diagnosis seems too good to be true. Simple issues like strep throat diagnosis is not close to that. Right. That's a great question. You know, you have to have some gold standard to compare against, right? So the gold standard that was used in that study was clinical diagnosis by psychiatry as to whether somebody had schizophrenia or not. So uh, that's as best as we can do, uh, unless some, someone else comes up with a better way to establish the fact, really, it's a clinical diagnosis, and it's substantiated uh, in this study by the presence of a network in the brain or, well, what, that was the other interesting component. I didn't get a chance to elaborate on that, but when you apply an artificial intelligence algorithm to filter through the data and try to make uh, sense of it by selecting certain elements in the data that when, it, when you put it all together, enable the diagnosis, we don't know what the artificial intelligence engine is detecting. We have no clue what it is. You can't go back and say, okay, I'm gonna go look into the machine because it's just what it's doing is way too complex to even begin to understand and tease out. That's the black box problem with artificial intelligence. But I think, I, I think that answers your question because I don't think we can do better than a clinical diagnosis at this point. So when we apply any kind of other diagnostic test, it has to be measured against it. So if it were perfect, it would be a hundred, but you know, 99.3 is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Richard asks, can you develop enlarging perivascular spaces after concussion? And what is the significance of rapid enlargement? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that uh, I'm not at, as up to the literature on this as I should be, but I suspect it has to do with something called the glymphatic system. This is a system that was only recognized about 10 years ago. We never knew about it. And we, we always thought that cerebral spinal fluid in the brain was there to cushion the brain. And that's not the major function of cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid circulates in and out of the brain. And it's driven, what we think, by the pulsatility of the blood vessels. So we're coming back to the blood vessel story again. The more preserved the pulsatility of the blood vessels is, the more uh, healthy your lymphatic system is because we think it's driving 
the cerebral spinal fluid through the brain tissue. And we know that it's important because when you go to sleep at night, the volume of that fluid being pumped through the brain tissue is double compared to what it is when you're awake. And it makes sense to think that the reason this is happening is to get rid of waste products. And the perivascular spaces are part of that lymphatic system. So why they expand after a disease condition is unknown. It may be that there's a block in the lymphatic system and they start to fill up and that's bad for the brain. And I do remember one patient who had um, an, a near occlusion of their internal carotid artery. So this is one of the major blood vessels that supply the brain with blood. And preoperatively, the patient had dilated perivascular spaces. Then the patient had what's called an endarterectomy where they literally open up the blood vessel and remove the blockage. So now the brain is getting its normal supply of blood that it hadn't had for a long time. And about a week after the surgery, we, we repeated the MRI and those dilated vascular spaces disappeared. So we don't understand this physiology very well right now. It's very, uh, the, the research into it, our, our understanding of it is very nascent. And I think in the next 10 years, we're gonna find out how important this whole system is. And I hope we can answer the question about what's driving the fluid through it. And so far, the best solution for that is that it's the pulsatility of the brain blood vessels. And it really means that, you know, you got to keep your vessels healthy. It's, it's interesting because, you know, the, one of the primary modes of prevention of dementia is exercise. There's a strong correlation between exercise and the prevention of dementia and exercise it really gets blood pumping. I mean, there's no question about that. And how that then maintains the health of your vessels, I think is the key question. What is it about exercise that keeps your vessels healthy and keep, keeps the tissues perfused properly? Great, thank you. Colleen asks, when you get to the point of having an imaging modality that says you're 99% sure you've had a concussion, how does that help versus the doctor saying, we think you have a concussion? Well, um, it helps both uh, the patient and the doctor to make a decision about whether or not the patient is able to return to work. Uh, if they play sports, to go back to playing sports, it's an indicator uh, that uh, things are going in the right direction. Uh, when it comes to um, medical legal issues, uh, there may be, uh, you know, a firm objective diagnosis of a traumatic event to the brain becomes critical in those, in those situations. So I think that the ability to make these diagnoses is really needs to be improved and made more accurate. And I think that's where we're all trying to um, contribute to getting to that ultimate goal. And, you know, it, it would be nice to know if you hit your head, uh, whether you've actually disrupted the tissue enough to actually cause injury. And clearly if you're young and you're, you're playing a sport and you're, you know, you have an important game coming up and you've had a concussion, <clears throat> they, uh, young uh, individuals in their teens and younger are much more susceptible to a second, it's called a second hit. And if you, if you injure the brain before it's had a chance to fully heal, there have been cases where really severe brain injury has evolved secondary to just what looks like a simple second concussion. They have a tremendous disruption in all of the metabolic pathways, the vascular pathways, and that injury can be lethal. People have died after a second hit. So just making the diagnosis of concussion for uh, for being able to know when to return to work, when to return to play. And the other thing is we need to know when it's the right time to implement maybe exercise therapy or other therapies that help to get the neurons functioning back uh, to their normal levels to recover. So yeah, I think it's very important to have a diagnostic ability. Great, thank you. I'm just aware of the time. We've had really great questions. I, I think we'll do one more. Christina, um, uh, she says, my husband suffered a workplace TBI in 2012. 
Over the past 10 years, imaging has shown encephalomalacia and gliosis and iron deposit all in the frontal lobe area. Uh, Short-term memory severely affected starting four years ago. I've been looking into imaging options to show and give answers as to the health decline and why. How can we inquire about advanced imaging such as functional MRI? Yeah, functional imaging is like I said, uh, we're, we're still not good enough without artificial intelligence methods to be able to tease out differences between healthy people and injured people. But what I can say is that some of the research that we've done and published on has shown that with more advanced brain injury, uh, there's an accelerated progression of uh, tissue loss compared to a healthy brain. And I kind of showed that in the concussion slide with the war veterans who had had blast injury, showing that the thickness of their cerebral cortex gets thinner four times faster over time after having had a, con a single or maybe multiple concussive events when they were in the service. So what we need to do is we need to understand better from, research, from a research perspective what it is that's causing this acceleration in the uh, thinning of the brain cortex, because that's not what you want. You want to be able to maintain the health of that cortex, and we want to be able to find strategies to maintain the health of that cortex. And maybe it's a blood vessel issue. Maybe there are other issues in, in, in axons and the other tissues in the brain that are impeding the uh, ability of the brain to fully recover. So for example, some people have shown with SPECT studies, uh, actually, that you can target cells in the brain that are present uh, as part of the inflammatory process. So these are called microglia. And there's a tracer uh, that is targeting microglia. It's just come out over the last few years. And this tracer um, uh, will sort of stick to those microglial vessels that are signs that there's ongoing brain inflammation after the injury that can be responsible for continued secondary image injury to the brain. Again, this is an area where it's probably not diagnostic in a single subject just yet. It may again, it may again require the ability to analyze the data with artificial intelligence uh, uh, methodology. And I think, as I said in the conclusion of my presentation, that's where we're starting to get into in the next 10 years I expect that there's gonna be significant advances in those in that regard. Great, okay, thank you so much. I think uh, we'll have to uh, end it there. Thank you, Dr. Miklas for an excellent uh, evening and thank you to all of you uh, for your great questions. Just, uh, there'll be a survey that will be coming around. It takes you probably less than two minutes to fill out if you've got any feedback for us, suggestions. Uh, we really welcome that. And we will be back again in two weeks. Uh, that'll be November the 8th. And we have Dr. John Rutka with us and he's gonna be talking about dizziness and concussion. Thanks very much. <laughs>